Hi, Sherry. Hi, Karen. It's good to meet you and face to face. <laughs> yeah, it is actually really nice. Yeah, I yeah, enjoyed we, both your well, I enjoyed your your first conversation with Paul, and I haven't seen the second one fully yet, but it'll be good. And and we've been corresponding a little bit through comments on other people's conversations, so that's been interesting. Yeah, yeah, I've been having fun in the, I mean, things that really um, grab me, you know, that I just I just have to say something. Mm -hmm. Um. I've been having fun in the in the in the comment section with so yeah it's been good it's been great yeah there, there's something it's, about it's, this idea of this quest for meaning that everybody is on that um, Paul is kind of a hub of all of these conversations that are happening and it's a very interesting process yeah it is it's you know it's uh it's also a place where people can speak freely mm -hmm. and and I think that that really helps and. You know, I, I would say that most people are thinking deeply about things, but they just don't know where to go with those thoughts. And, and, and Boy, this that, is a place that is to so do true. that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was thinking deeply about things for like 15 years and didn't have anybody yeah. to talk to about what I was yeah. thinking. So it just rolls around in there like marbles. I know. And so it's, um, just, it's great. So our connection is really through Jordan Peterson and Paul Vanderclay. That's how we got to know each other online. And so yep. I, ha I have this quote that I ran into while I was reading Maps of Meaning this morning. And yep. it, it might take a minute to unwind because he writes in a very sure. dense fashion. <clears throat> yeah, I haven't read Maps of Meaning, so. Well, he has a chapter in there called Anomaly, which I think, is is a big word in his viewpoint and as i've processed it it seems to me like it's a big word in the whole area of what where meaning actually comes from and um yeah so he says the upsetting capacity of the anomalous is simultaneously the vital source of interest mm -hmm the vital source of meaning and individual strength. Furthermore, the ability to upset ourselves, to undermine and revitalize our own beliefs, is an intrinsic, necessary, and divine aspect of the human psyche, part of the seminal word itself. So as I analyze what he's saying here, when he talks about anomaly, he's talking about those things which come into our, our field. We, we live in the known, and once in a while we fall into the unknown, or the unknown right. comes at us. A, a car swerves out in front of us and right. we end up in right. an accident, or um, we stumble over a rock. A, an anomaly yeah. can be a very small thing or it can be a very big thing like Hitler. Things yeah. that, that come in and and upset either and it can be a small organism that gets upset or it can be a human being or it can be a nation or it can be a world so anomalies come on many different levels and would you uh, would you uh, would you classify an anomaly then as as a disturbance um, would you think of it as a disturbance kind of of what of what what's going you know you've got this status quo happening in mm -hmm. your life you you always kind of know what what to expect you know what's relevant what's not relevant mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden this disturbance is it always in that aspect like i i don't i'm, I'm just trying to clarify that is yes it always I, a disturbance? I, I i think it always is a disturbance that that's probably a pretty good okay. word uh, my mother used to talk about when i was a kid she used to talk about the naker in the oyster did yeah. you hear that phrase no. Well, so apparently the, the way pearls are made is the oyster ends up getting a little grain of sand or something inside right. of it. And it's very irritating. Yeah. So it, it creates this stuff to put around the grain of sand to protect it from the, right. the pain. And, and that creates yeah. this beautiful little pearl. Yeah. So, so that's kind of a visual. But when Jordan, you've heard Jordan Peterson talk about the heroic journey, right? That the hero is 
in the village, everything is known and good and outside is unknown and there's lots of scary stuff, but the hero is willing to go over there into the unknown, find the maiden, battle the dragon, and in rescuing the maiden, he brings back anything else that's of value over there into the village and kind of remakes the village. Right. So on a, the other place that I see it happening is, um, and I don't know how you feel about evolution. I, oh, I I'm, I'm okay. Okay. So I always puzzled with where does the information come from? Because obviously our DNA has 3.4 billion letters of code in it. <laughs> and and if, if we actually evolved from a single cell organism that started out with much less information, how does information build over time? Yeah. Especially when you consider the second law of thermodynamics and information entropy and all of those things, how does information increase without any outside input? And then I was reading one evolutionist who said that every time an organism confronts an anomaly, I don't, he probably didn't use the word anomaly, but something comes into the organism's life that is not normal. And it's an it obstacle, has, yeah. It's a, some sort of an obstacle, yes. And so it has to learn it has to adapt. Easy. Well, they use the word adapt. It has to adapt to the obstacle. But in the adaptation, yeah. it's actually increasing its ability to function, which increases generation upon generation, increases the amount of information that's available to pass on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. I know in the, in the original, I think in the original Darwinian theory, that was not a possibility to pass on learned information. capacity. Yeah. But but I think they're saying now, I don't know much about these theories, but I think the gen to me, the general idea is any obstacle that we face is an opportunity to learn, of right? Course. Yeah. Any suffering, yeah. Um, any, we always have a choice when we face an obstacle, we can either, many choices, <laughs> we can either stay where we are, we can run away, or we can walk yeah. into it and try to get from it what is there. And those are the little treasures hidden in darkness. And, and yeah, yeah, so I sure. think that's also what Jordan Peterson is talking about when he talks about order and chaos. That chaos yeah. is where all the treasures lie. Yeah. Yeah, like that. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, from what, the, the way that I kind of map it onto my life, that, that whole idea of order and chaos is mm -hmm. that it's that it's it, that symbol of the yin and the yang, right? It, it's it's order and chaos, but meaning lies in in the in the center, yes. where where you're right right between the two. So too much order is 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 boring mm -hmm. and ossifying. It ossifies, right? Right. Too much chaos is confusing and will drive you into madness. Mm -hmm. And um, and so you have to strike a balance between the order and and the chaos you need to be uh, this is my understanding of what he's talking about is is that you need to be kind of exploratory in your in your mode of being your mode of being should should always have like one foot in in um in order mm -hmm. but one foot in in chaos and you know and that's kind of moving you moving you forward Right. And, um, and of course, it, as soon as you do that, you're, you're, you're encountering anomalies, right? Mm -hmm. You're encountering something that you haven't encountered before, something that you need to problem solve, something that might be in your way that you have to move physically or mentally right. or spiritually or emotionally. And, um, and then those things are all part of that process. And I mean, it's... <sighs> It, sound, it might sound really simplistic to say it's very much like growing up. It's like being an well, no, infant. Is, is growing up a simple thing? I don't think so. <laughs> well, that's just, that's just it, right? So, you know, you're, you're, you're totally dependent. Your life is ordered. Everything, all your needs are met, you know, and then you have to start stepping out into chaos and falling down and getting hurt and learning. And I, I one time 
saw a report on um, <clears throat> the number of injuries in uh, small children, I think under the age of four, five, or maybe five. It's, it's a long while since I, since I read this, but um, people that live in third world countries and people that live in first world countries. So these are just accidents that small children have. Mm -hmm. And small children that live in dangerous situations learn very quickly to avoid things and not hurt themselves. Whereas we cushion our children. Mm -hmm. We start with padding around the crib, right? Yep. So they don't bump their heads. And walkers with wheels on them, you know, so that they don't crash into anything and hurt, you know, there's a big mm -hmm. buffer zone around them, right? And gates on stairs and everything. And then when when we think, oh, okay, they can manage these things, they fall down, they hurt themselves, they get their head caught in the, you know, in the crib some weird way because they haven't been dealing with the, the difficulties of life, mm -hmm. of their life, right from the beginning and learning how to avoid being hurt, right? So there's, there's, right. Some, a, there's a benefit to, and I remember one time um, we bought a property way up north, you know, northern part of Canada, and uh, there was a family living there and they, they never lived in a house. They had six children. They lived outside in the summertime. They traveled. In Northern Canada. <laughs> yeah. In the summer, they traveled around in like a little caravan that he built. And um, they, camped, they camped out under the stars. They had tarps in case it was raining that they just slept under. So they didn't even have tents. And they, get, and they gathered all their own food and hunted. And in the wintertime, they lived inside of a canvas wall tent in a more southerly location. This was and like, they had a little... Was this like Captain America? Did you see yeah. that movie? No. There's a no, movie this is about... a real family that I met. Well, there's a, movie, <laughs> there's a movie about a family like that. And I thought, I thought it was just a story. But you mean there's a real family like that? Wow. No, this is a real family. Yeah. Wow. She was German. She was German. He was French Canadian. And she, she was a school teacher in Germany when she uh, immigrated to Canada. So she homeschooled all the kids. They picked berries. They dried berries. They hunted moose. They dried the meat. They, everything was done hunter gatherer style. Right. Anyway, they had this little two year old and she had an open campfire going all the time because she was always cooking. You know, she had a big pot over the fire and she was always making meals because she had a large family. And this little toddler was like, you know, teetering around this fire. And I was just, you know, naturally it, it, jumping to, and she, she'd say, she's okay. She knows her way around the fire. And she did. She knew her way around the fire, you know? And um, so I guess what I'm saying in long form is, there are definite, um, we're building protect, we're building in protections for ourselves by encountering these anomalies, right? Mm -hmm. We're learning to overcome. And, and, and that's, that's what, that's what scripture talks about. Believers, those who are going to be with Christ are overcomers. They are those who have overcome Mm -hmm. right so it's 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 actually a, a huge thing it's not it's not just a small thing to overcome it's 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 a part of our growing up in 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 you know in this world and and spiritually i think well it, and it seems to be built into everything not just um not just our life not just our daily life but it seems to also be built into the way the physical universe functions um yeah. and, and i have a couple of examples there one is um and i'll come back to this in a second i'm going to throw the word out here so i remember i'm going to talk about it hormesis and hormesis h-o-r-m-i-s-i-s H -O -R -M -I -S -I -S. and the other one is okay. when my older daughter who is now just a little bit younger than you when she was uh, a baby, we lived in North Dakota. And for whatever reason, most of the parents in North Dakota would keep their children inside the first eight weeks. They would never take them outside because of fear of catching cold or bacteria or whatever. 
but we just kept yeah. doing life the way we had always done life and we'd take her wherever we went and and of course we'd wrap her up and keep her warm when it was cold outside but we just went everywhere in the winter and so she was right. never ever sick and all the other kids around us were sick all the time with the sniffles and so i kind of thought right. I'll bet because she's being exposed to harsher conditions and she's outdoors where the bacteria are all dead because nothing can survive yeah. out there, right? <laughs> so no she's not, no. Yeah, she's not getting sick, right? So I, I think yeah. there's something there that, and it's the whole thing of overprotecting, you know, um, overprotecting sometimes I, I, I've heard even that this leads to asthma and things like that. Um, that yeah, yeah. And allergies, you know, lots right. of allergies and, and it, and it, you know, if you want to get really um, philosophical about it, 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 it ends up not only not only weakening the immune system, but it weakens the individual overprotection, motherly overprotection. Oh yes, and that's it, that's Jordan you know, it's evil, evil mother, right? <laughs> the the devouring mother. Yeah, the know? devouring mother. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what was this hormesis? Well, so hormesis is a big thing in the fitness realm right now, and it has to do with putting your body through maximum stress, but in very small doses. Mm -hmm. So like maybe lifting very heavy weight, but just for a short period of time and then going back to your normal weight lifting or um, running beyond your capacity to endure, but for only 20 seconds and then going back to your yeah. normal pace and doing this periodically. But also they're talking about different kinds of food that have little phytotoxins in them that um, that you take in and actually puts a stress on your body because it's a slight it's slightly poisonous to your body and that, right. that when you eat those things it it causes your body to get stronger 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 and and so there are a lot of I don't know what all the hormesis are there's a lot of them um, jumping into ice cold lake and jumping out yeah, again yeah so you're just exposing yourself to very harsh conditions for a very brief moment. My husband used to tell me all the time about, my husband is really uh, super fit, but he does it in a really simple way. And it's his own thing that he's come up with, you know, like yeah, he's 60, but he still does his 30 push-ups every morning and every night. And it only takes him like yeah. I don't know, three minutes or something like that. And then he runs, but he runs past his capacity to run and he only does it for like eight minutes or when he goes to the gym right. he looks kind of silly because he'll lift weights like this <laughs> instead of instead of the thing that they always say to do it really slow you know because he doesn't oh, right, have right, right. much time into it but he used to call it his rubber band principle that if you push yourself if oh. beyond your capacity it's like stretching a rubber band yeah. the first time it's very very hard to stretch but the second time you pull that same rubber band, it goes much easier. And the third mm -hmm. time it's easier. And, and so, and he used to tell me that to try to get me to be more that way, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but you're the artist, right? <laughs> you're stretching am, your mind. <laughs> yeah, I'm, that's right. <laughs> so anyway, I think there's really something in that. And, and so, so, um, so the second thing I wanted to talk to you about before we get on, we can keep going with anomaly, but I, I, we, I heard a message yesterday at church. I go to a church that um, in the summer they show movies for four weeks. Well, they don't show the whole movie, but they do a sermon based on the movie. To, okay. I mean, it's a way of draw people in, I suppose, but it's also a way yeah. of helping us to look at the culture and see where Christ shows up in everything. Mm -hmm. So yesterday the message was on Princess Bride. Oh, I love that movie. You love okay, you know the movie. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, the very beginning when Wesley um and Buttercup, okay, Buttercup yeah. is treating him very poorly. And yeah. she'll say, Carry my water bucket over there, and he'll say, with beautiful eye contact, As you wish. As you wish. As <laughs> And and the through the course of the movie, as the as the pastor was teaching about this, he was talking about our when our response to Christ is as you wish. That that 
he works in us and through us, um, you know, freeing us and strengthening us and all of those things when we yield to him, when we say, as you wish. But mm. I also had this thing running through my head when I first heard Wesley say that. It really sounds weird, but I'm going to say it anyway. Yeah, say that, it. I'm, I'm really yeah. curious now. <laughs> that there's, there's some sense in which Christ is, God is always saying to us through Christ, as you wish. That's exactly what I hear. Like, like when you started out, and then you said that the pastor said that that's what we need to be saying. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, no, that's what God says to us. Yeah. He, he looks at us and he says, as you wish. That's why he doesn't intervene in our catastrophes, you know, that our self um, inflicted pain or whatever, you know, he's there. He's, you know, he, he, he's, he's right there at our bid and calling, mm -hmm. but it's as, as we wish, you know, and, and I think that, I think that that could easily be demonstrated just in the life of Jesus in the gospels, mm -hmm. you know, like leaving the village and, and, and wiping the dust from your feet. You know, it's like, as you wish, you know, you want to, so Sherry, you know, I want, I want to, Sherry, I want to continue with this. Um, there's a big noise outside. I need to stop. So can you hold okay. on for just a okay. second? I'm going to pause. Sure. sure. Okay. Okay. That was, uh, <laughs> that was a big noise outside, <laughs> but I got it taken care of. Yeah. So Sherry, you, you were talking about as you wish in the movie, the princess bride, what does that mean to you? Right. Yeah. Just, just what I was saying before is, is, I would, I would have to differ with the pastor in that I think that that's, that's a position that God would take with us mm -hmm. as individuals and, and as, as a church. Um, I mean, it's as, as you wish in the sense that um, he's not forcing anyone to, you know, be in relationship with him. He's not, he's not, um, but he does have a plan, I guess. That's that's the other thought that goes with that. So it's as you wish, as you wish, as you wish. But like Wesley, he's not. He he's in love. He loves her, and he's just gonna wait. And when she's ready, he's still there. Mm -hmm. You know. So it's it's not it's not. Um, See, this is the, I've been listening to John Dravakey and uh, just learning so much. And the, the idea that, um, that, you know, that at one point in history, we had the ability to reach up to God. And then after the Reformation, it was God reaching down to us. So it was, the, you know, and it became, it was arbitrary. It's like, you don't deserve this right? You're a sinner. And, and uh, many are called, and, but few are chosen. Um, and so, as John Verveke puts it, you, it, it, what it did was initiate the, uh, the Protestant work ethic. So the only way people could show the other people around them that God, they were in God's favor was that they were successful, they had nice things, they were clean, they weren't sick, they were, right? And so they, they started work, 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 which then ended up introducing capitalism and corporate capitalism, like the, the um, repercussions of that ethic are incredible, really. And, well, and so there's, but there's, what it did with- There's repercussions what it did was both it, ways with that one, so. Of course, yeah. yeah. And, but, but for me, what it did was it removed the ability to have a relationship because a relationship is reciprocal, right? It's, it's one person giving and another one taking another one giving and another one taking. And so that it has to be in order to be real, it has to be reciprocal. And, and, um, Oh, I just kind of lost my train of thought. So with this idea of, um, of us saying, as you wish, it's, it's a slave master portrayal to me, you know, uh, because God is greater than, 
right? He isn't equal to. So, so it can't really be that we're on equal footing with God. And, and when we start saying, as you wish, um, then how, how are we to know what he wishes? And where are oh, we going? Oh, well, okay. So, so I, I, I didn't make very clear what, what he was saying because. Okay. So we say, as you wish in our service to each other, to others, okay. as Wesley did to her. And in, in the message, he also talked about how Christ, um, not, that, not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave himself for us, right? And that that's, mm -hmm. that's, the very, that's the very picture that Wesley is. He gives up his life for her at the end, right? Mm -hmm. and then he dies. Um, so the as you wish was not us. I said it wrong the first time. Oh, okay. My brain doesn't work very well. It's not, it's not. It's not saying as you wish to God, but it's saying as you wish, allowing ourselves to, to, to be a servant to others, right? To, okay. to focus mm -hmm. on that side of ourselves, which I, I think is a perfectly valid interpretation. And the yeah. other interpretation mm -hmm. as well as uh, um, Wesley representing Christ giving up his life for his bride, which, you know, right. I, that's, that's all there too. When I was thinking of the as you wish, and I really like what you said because I hadn't really considered that side of it, um, but I was also thinking about as you wish, you get to choose. Um, you know how Jordan Peterson always talks about where every moment we're facing this infinite field of potential, yeah, and and we have to find a way through it somehow. So we have to make a choice, right? And When, when God says, as you wish, he's saying he, he is always a servant. I mean, mm -hmm. Christ is the quintessential servant. So God is always serving. And he, he gives his reign to the just and the unjust alike. So he's always mm -hmm. serving. Whether we accept or reject, he's always serving. So whatever we want, you get what you want. <laughs> yeah, and, and if you exactly. want, if you want for the wrong reasons, um, sometimes you won't get if you want for the wrong reasons. But sometimes you get when you want for the wrong reasons, and what you get is not what you want. But you get what well, you want. What you get. You, you you don't get what you need, right? What you get is the anomaly. That's what you get. Yeah, or the yeah the you catastrophe. You get the yeah. thing that makes you grow, right? So in yeah. the end, it, you know, like, I don't know if I'm just like a, a, a completely naive optimist <laughs> or, or if there's any wisdom in this, but I, I really believe that God is good. And I think, I think that's the bottom you, line. Right you, have, there. you have said that, right? Yeah. I, I remember you saying that in, and I remember it because that's, that is the bottom line for me. God is good. Mm -hmm. And because God is good, then whatever happens is good. If, if I am surrendered, you know, and I don't mean like laying like a sacrifice on a stone table or anything like that. But I just mean that, you know, I have acknowledged that God is real, that Jesus is the savior, that I am going to walk in this in, in truth, in, in this truth, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's my life. And whatever happens, it's good, even if it's not good. So, mm -hmm. and, and I tested that out at one point. Um, I had a, a car accident when I lived in Switzerland, and I got a really bad whiplash, and I had three little kids. And I seriously, like, my neck was like, I couldn't lift it, you know? And I was having all the regular whiplash pain and, and, um, my life was pretty regimented, pretty scheduled. You know, the kids all went to school at different times because that's how it is in Europe, you know, and then you got to have lunch ready and you got to do your shopping because your fridge is only this big, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so life got immediately difficult, like more difficult than I could almost bear. And, um, just because of the pain. And, and I was like, oh, Lord, why? Like, why? And I, I was angry. 
and and then the verse rejoice in the lord always and again i say rejoice came to my mind and i was like you know <laughs> and i thought no you know what i'm going to do it so i got my husband was home i left him with the kids i got in the vehicle i drove up onto this little mountain behind our house i mm -hmm. got out of the car i walked into the woods and i put my hands in the air and i said okay lord i'm going to i'm, I'm embracing this uh -huh. you know and i'm rejoicing in this i don't know why but i know you're good and whatever happens from this point forward is it's going to be good even if it's hard and and that was kind of a turning point for me in my walk with the lord because that's how i started to see all these anomalies in my life as good things until of course i got really you know, I had a really di difficult time and, and then, um, and then it was more difficult to see it as a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I guess what I'm saying with that is, and it isn't, you know, it's not always a comfort to, to anyone who's in the middle of, of these things because they they are difficult, but it, it, it's that honing, it's that rubbing, you know, it's like, uh, what's that verse that talks about Christ? Iron being... sharpens, uh, so as one man sharpens another iron, as iron, one man Sharpen sharpens steel. another, as iron sharpens. Yeah, yeah. That's there's that, but there's also that you know that Christ is the rock that you come up against, and some people, some people. Oh rape, yes, uh -huh. yes. You know, and um, the stump. It's the passage so, about the stumbling stone some people come upon the stumbling stone and and they break yeah yeah that that's the anomaly yeah you know and i think that, that that i think that that's indicative too of that what jordan peterson talks about when he's when he's talking about the burning burning off the dead wood you know mm -hmm. getting getting rid of those things so you know i don't want to sound flaky but suffering is it's integral to our life mm -hmm. it is you know, when, when you say life is suffering, you can also turn that around and say suffering is life. I think right? actually that's more true than life is suffering because yeah, when you say life is suffering, you're identifying life with suffering. Yeah, you're giving... It's kind of the Irma Bombeck thing, you know? It's the life... life if life is a bowl full of cherries, why am I always in the pits? Remember that book she wrote years <laughs> <Yes>. ago? <laughs> I, <did. laughs> I remember the you title. Know, I, I never read the book, but I remember I didn't the title. <laughs> but you know, it, it's 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 not the optimistic. It's the pessimistic view, really. You know, of uh, you know, life is suffering, but but it is. I mean, that's that's kind of looking the dragon right in the face. You know, that's like saying, okay, I'm gonna, I, I'm ready, I'm, I'm ready to take this on. You know, to say that. But the opposite is true. Suffering is life. You know, and and oh, so I get here. I, mean, I guess here's the difference for me is that if you when Jordan Peterson says life is suffering, that for the average person hearing that, that is a Sounds hopeless. Of course, he always he always follows it up with, "But you're more than you think you are." Mm -hmm. But I would say it a little bit of a different way. I would say, in life, there is a lot of suffering, and you will suffer. But God is bigger than you think He is, <laughs> <laughs> you know? because um, in life we suffer those things come upon you. you, you can't, it's reality. It's like Paul Vanderclay said the other day, reality is that which governs. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to Travis the next day and I asked him what he thought about that. And he said, well, that which governs, what, what does that really mean? I guess when you say reality is that which governs, it's that which requires obedience. Right. And that's what reality does. <laughs> You have no choice. Reality comes into your life and it's there. You have to do something. Right. You have you have to make yeah. some choice about it. And and yeah. uh, I think until we're 25, we live in this kind of utopian world where we think we can recreate reality to our own will. You know, we can, 
I, I remember my daughter, when she was little, she'd say, well, why can't everything just cost a penny? Why does everything have to yeah. be expensive? You know? <laughs> and, and, and the old Star Trek series, they, they got to the place where um, they would talk about how in the new world, there was no money because money was not important and everything was free. I'm like, okay, that's the world you're positing for 300 years from now. Good luck. Yeah. You know, they don't take yeah. into account human greed or any of those things. So um, we have this utopian idea, but, but then you stumble into reality. You know, you have to go out and get a job and pay taxes. And, and uh, I remember when I was 20, 24, we bought this little farm out in Iowa and we, we did a lot of stupid things. We bought 52 heifers who had never birthed. <laughs> So for all 52, it was their first year birthing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what did we know, you know? <laughs> so, so we're out there at four o'clock in the morning having to pull a calf from some heifer that's having a hard time and she's prolapsing oh, yeah. or something. And uh, you ram your arm up in there and grab hold of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, life happens. And there's a lot yeah. of suffering in life for the animals and for the people and for everything else. But um, Jordan Peterson said a, a while back in some video he was talking about just exactly how much suffering are you, do you want to take away from somebody else? Because you don't know if you take that suffering away from them, what else you're taking away from them. Right. Because whatever that they might be. And, and so this goes back to what I was saying about anomaly in, um, uh, evolution. Evolution is not just unguided. Even, even if, even if the only way that God intervenes in evolution is with anomaly, he's the one that provides the anomaly. And the anomaly is mm -hmm. always perfect suit, perfectly suited to the individual organism for whatever it needs to learn. Because right. every obstacle that we come into our lives is perfectly suited to us. Those are not just random. Yeah things that come into our lives they're perfectly suited right yeah and i mean there's law there's laws there's laws um there are consequences to your actions right mm -hmm. so you know you have promiscuous um unprotected sex and you get pregnant mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and um so yeah you know i think it's there is a there is an element of randomness to suffering and then there is also the I, I think there is um, suffering that that we bring upon ourselves with mm -hmm. wrong choices, wrong, bad decisions. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but God says, as you wish, and he works with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. He doesn't just say, as you wish and watch us suffer. He he says, as you wish. And then he works with it. It's like you with a painting or a potter with some clay mm -hmm. and uh, you know something goes awry in the creation of whatever it is you're doing you know a, a glob of paint just or a hair or you know yeah. and then it's like okay i gotta work with this i gotta you know you're not, you don't stop and walk away from it mm -hmm. you work with it you fix it but you have to do it gently because you're making something and you want it to be right and, um, you know, and, and I think God is like that too. I mean, we're made in the image of God. We're creative like God is. Mm -hmm. We have the same instincts for creativity as he does. We don't treat our creations with disrespect or, mm -hmm. you know, contempt. We love them and we want to make them as beautiful as we can imagine that they should be. And I think that that's how... I think that that's how God is, you know? Um, in one of my conversations with Paul, I talked about um, the fact that I tried to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly didn't believe, or I honestly believed that that would remove me from the love of God, doing that, that act, mm -hmm. right? Would, would remove me from the love of God, that that was really crossing the line, taking my own life you know being my own god and and it and it was the op his reaction to it was the opposite of what 
I thought would happen. He, he, he was right there. He, he said, I, I'm here, you know, and, and I got you. And this is not what I wanted for you, but it's okay. You know, and I know, I know how hard it is because he does, mm -hmm. right? He lived it. Yes. So, um, I think I wrote, I was, I was, I was commenting back and forth with somebody on um, one of the conversations that Paul had. And I said to him, you know, nothing is what it seems when it comes to God. Mm -hmm. You can't say, you know, you can't say anything. You, I don't think that you can say, you know, God doesn't like it if you do this or God only will bless that. You know, we, we have no idea because it's all about relationship and relationship is intimate. It's between the two people who are having it. Mm -hmm. And, and to me, not knowing or, or, or believing that nothing is like it as it seems, mm -hmm. that's faith, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to say, okay, you have to let go of everything. Mm -hmm. And you, and you just have to say, okay, this is not what I think. And it never is. So, you know, it, it's, it's just like a wild ride. And, well, and, all, and, and I, th I think that goes to this idea that our knowledge is always insufficient. Of course. Right? And, yeah, and because we're finite. But, but the enemy tried to convince, well, he did. He convinced Eve and Adam in the garden, or convinced Eve in the garden that that knowledge was within her reach. If she just did this one thing, she would have all the knowledge she needed. And so mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. kind of like these people now who are who think that everything is material is everything is material, everything is deterministic or whatever, you know, and they're trying to um, say they know everything. <laughs> no, yeah. their their knowledge is insufficient. So so when you worship your own knowledge or when you worship your own intellect, you you get what you want. You may get more intellect, you may get more intellectual, you may get more knowledge, but whatever knowledge you get, it's always going to be insufficient because you don't yeah, know. And you don't know what's no, coming and, in the next moment. No, and the scriptures say, you know, in, in getting knowledge, in you know, in 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 seeking all that knowledge, mm -hmm. don't forget to get wisdom. And that, and you know, and, and this is the project that John Verbeke is all about, right? Wisdom. And wisdom comes through experience. That's where you get wisdom. That's the toddler careening around the fire, you know? They have a certain amount of wisdom about where the next step goes because they've already made the mistake of falling on the hot rock and burning their hand, you know? Mm -hmm. So you can you can get all kinds of understanding you can you know you can get all kinds of knowledge you can read books there's many books there's even more books than there ever were you know now and and yet you will not attain wisdom until you start um like Kierkegaard says you know you got to step out i don't know what is it 30,000 fathoms you know and hover over there and know that God has me like mm -hmm. there's nothing under me here. I could die, you know, mm -hmm. that's wisdom. And, um, and the wisdom is, is, and I think Jordan Peterson makes that really clear too, is that wisdom is found in the anomaly. It's found in experiencing those obstacles in overcoming, mm -hmm. you know, and it goes back to that, you know, like even revelation is, you know, it is they who will overcome. My sister said to me one time, we are overcomers, Sherry. We are overcomers. And it's true. You know, that's what we do. Well, and you were saying before, you don't think it's something that people want to hear necessarily when they're in the midst of suffering. And, and I... Not I always. That, no. Yeah. Well, I think that's really true for... And I know it was for me as an individual when, when I was in the midst of the worst trauma of my life and somebody came up to me and said, Oh, well, think about this other person who had this terrible trauma and 14 yeah. years later, it all turned out for the good. And I'm like, that's not helping. <laughs> no, no, that's not helping. So in one sense, we have to live through it on our own 
leaning into the Lord because he's really the only one who understands what's happening. And that's where our yeah. individual experience comes from, right? Our individual growth and wisdom and all of that. But yeah. there, the sense, in, I mean, the way in which another person can help when you're suffering is to just come alongside and, and hold your hand and say, I'm here with you. You know, I'm, that's right. I love you. Yeah, I'm praying I'm, for you. I'm here with you. Yeah. I'm walk I'm walking with you. Yeah. 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 That's the best way. I think that's the best way to, to, uh, and you know, Jordan Peterson says that too. He talks, you know, as a, as a clinical psychologist, he talks about the fact that sometimes you just need to listen. You just need to listen, mm -hmm. not talk, you know? And I think that's especially true when people are suffering because they're trying to work out what is happening to them. Mm -hmm. They need to verbalize it. They need to hash it out. They need to hear it from themselves. You know, I do a lot of, I've always written uh, poetry and, and um, that's always been a place where I find truth from myself. You know, it's like, I'm working through a problem. I feel like I need to write, you know, this, you know, and I, I sit down and I start writing and then I read it over and I go, there it is. There it is. I don't know. Maybe it's the same for you when you're painting, you know, it's like. Yeah, I, I think yeah. That's, that's probably true. That's probably true about the painting to some extent. Um, I, I can't do it through writing because I'm just not disciplined. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes write, but writing requires just an inordinate amount of sit down my butt on a chair and think my way through something and put the pieces together and write it. And that's yeah. one of the reasons I like writing comments on these videos because the thought will come into my head kind of fully formed and I get it down right away and I get it out there. And then I, yeah, I, nice. I, I copy it and save it and put it away because that you know i think it's an interesting thing about how um communication works that there's some kind of connections to the different databases in our head that things only come up in a certain conversation with a certain person and then that memory will come back oh i remember this thing that happened back then that fits right here but i would yeah. not have thought of that thing otherwise if i hadn't been talking to that person it's a yeah. very mysterious thing. Like when you were just talking well, like, about listening, I remembered when I was in the midst of the terrible things that you'll hear about when you listen to the interview with Paul, because I did talk through some of these things with him. Okay. Um, I met a woman who said, she just put her arms around me and she said, how are you doing? I, I'm fine. You know, she put her arms around me and hugged me. And as soon as she hugged me, I just started sobbing. And she mm -hmm. said, you've got to come to my house tomorrow for tea. So I went to her house for tea and she said, now tell me your story. And I, you know, I said, Oh, you know, it's not that much. You know, so she, you know, she said, tell me. And she, she made me talk for five hours. Wow. And she listened and she, she could intervene with um, just the right word to show me that she was on my side, even when my thoughts were ugly or tangled or stupid. She had just the right word at every one of those moments that would just release a new bank of stuff. And I was able to talk through my mother's death, my father's death, my husband's leaving me, my brother's death, all of that in that five hours in a way that I couldn't have done for myself, you know, which mm -hmm. allowed me to process in a, yeah, in an amazing way. So yeah, th that was such a gift. And I haven't thought about it in several years until you just said that. And then it just like that whole memory popped yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And those are the, the gifts, you know, like she, that might have been a small thing in her life right five hours and but it but it was a probably a turning point for you you know it definitely was right? grief mm -hmm. yeah it's huge yeah that's great yeah yep 
Well, I don't know if you have a few more minutes. Do you have a few oh, more yeah. minutes? Oh, yeah. There's one other. One other thing I wanted to bring up was a quote from Paul Vanderclay in one of his recent videos. I thought it was so genius. He says, materiality is a medium of communication. Materiality. Yeah. Now, is that a word? <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it's actually a word, but. but it's a Paul Vanderclay word. Yeah, it's a Paul Vanderclay word. <laughs> I'll tell you what it said to me and why it resonated with me, and then we sure. can throw it around a little bit. What it said to me is, yeah. it, the way that I've looked at the world ever since um, Christ came into my life was, and it, partly because I, when I was going through all this terrible stuff, all these anomalies that yeah. came into my life, <laughs> the, the only way I could stay sane was by just focusing on gratitude. 24 7 mm -hmm. every minute of the day praising so That's i would rejoicing. look at yeah yeah i would look at everything that i could anything that was in my field of view look at that beautiful leaf lord you created that leaf look look with that the yeah. you know the, the way that the leaf brings water you know the tree brings water up from the ground to feed that leaf and that's the way you are in my life and just talk talking through where i saw god in everything and how yeah. beautiful he made this world and so I, it sort of trained my mind to think that way. So in everything that is created, I can see his hand and it teaches me lessons all the time. Like you were talking about the, the beauty in, in the eyes of a newborn calf, right? There's an example of materiality. Yeah. It's a medium of communication. It's God communicating okay, with us just as clearly as he does through the word yeah um and and the other thing it made me think about is did you see paul vanderclay's interview with john van sloten who was the guy who talks about the glory of god in the in the laboring in a in the laboring man in the work of no. a, a man is that a recent conversation no i, th I think it's probably a year old i was going back and okay, looking no, at some old seen. ones because i hadn't watch the early Paul Vander Clay, you know, mm -hmm. stuff. And so this John Van Sloten made the comment. Um, well, John Van Sloten made a great comment, which I seem to have lost. <laughs> and um, here it is. God is moving outside the church, moving in the world, speaking in creation. Because the church has, in some ways, become so much order, so stultified, that God is moving outside the church to bring, bring fresh life in, right? And, yeah. and even all these physicists that keep finding out more and more and more about the world they're beginning to have to start ask questions. Well, wait a minute. It's not as it's not as simple as we thought it is. All is not what it no. seems. And so even many yeah. physicists are beginning to say, what is this exactly? And is it possible that there is a mind? Is it possible that there is a, you know, some force coming in from outside our universe? Mm -hmm. Are these things possible? And they're actually thinking about this stuff now. Because God is moving in the material world just as much as he's moving through his word and through the history of his life and resurrection and, and all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. So what was his, what was Paul, ben, what was Paul's quote? Materiality, materiality, is, materiality is a medium of communication. Okay. It's a way of communicating. And so just I was the material thinking, things in our, in our world communicate with us yeah oh yeah yeah and it's a way of god communicating with us well i mean you know the scripture talks about that you know everything reveals the glory of god right and all creation moans and waits yeah you know for for the new heaven and the new earth um i always i used to have the standing argument with my father when i was a kid because i'm an animal lover and, and I mean, my family calls me Dr. Doolittle because I have this way, you know, <laughs> with animals and I've rehabilitated lots of wildlife and, you know, it's just a thing right in my life. 
And um, it's not something that I, you know, I run out and, and seek to find. It just ends up that way. And, and I, I have a farm. I have lots of animals. And so, and, and uh, I remember as a kid saying, arguing with my father about whether or not animals can reason. So this is, you know, in the early 70s or whatever, my dad's saying, animals can't reason, you know. And I, and I said, yeah, well, look, the dog wanted to, you know, was just headed out the door. And now she turned around and went back to her bed and laid down. So she made a decision. If she made a decision, she can reason, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I always, I always gave these living things the benefit of the doubt. That was my attitude. Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I don't know much about you. I can only see what I can see, what's relevant for me to see, really. But I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. And then I remember I was reading through um, the Old Testament and I came across the story of Balaam's donkey, right? Mm -hmm. And this was a win for me, like with my, this standing thing with my dad, right? <laughs> so, so we get to Balaam's donkey and, you know, Balaam's trying to get through the gate and there's this angel ready to strike him down. The donkey's not going. And he starts beating on the donkey. And then the donkey says, listen, I've served you all these years. Why, why are you treating me like this? I, you know? And I, I went to my dad and I said, okay, what do you think of that? And he said, well, that's just God speaking through the donkey. And I said, no, it isn't. It doesn't say that. It says God loosed the donkey's tongue. And the donkey talked about himself. He didn't talk about God. Mm -hmm. He talked about himself. He said, hey, listen, I have, tre I have been serving you well all these years, and now you doubt me? You know? So as far as materiality, mm -hmm. revealing God in the world, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. God says it does. And it moans and waits for his return. You know? Um, I've had to put down horses that got diseased. I've had to put down goats that broke their legs. And I've always said to them when they're gone, I actually, I actually have a little boneyard on my farm. Mm -hmm. And there's a plaque there that says, all creation moans and waits. You know, mm. all this kind of suffering is coming to an end. And I know that you know, my sister, she, she, uh, she has horses. She lives way out, in the, way out in the boonies. And uh, she said to me, you know why I love horses so much? I said, why? She said, because they're going to come bearing Christ when he returns. Hmm. They're the animals that he's, he's going to be on, you know? And, and, and so, I mean, I don't, I'm not anthropomorphizing animals. I don't do that. I don't treat them like human beings. I don't dress them up in clothes and I don't put them in strollers. <laughs> <laughs> They're all, you know, they are what they are. But I, I really feel like, um, I, I, mean, I think it was in the conversation that you had that I watched, you were talking about how everything is connected. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, um, I've got these university students staying at my farm because they're researching uh, mouse and bull populations in salvage log areas because we had uh, some major forest fires here in 2017. Mm -hmm. And then the logging companies go in and they salvage, they, they cut all the logs. And, and so they're, they're researching the mouse and bull population in these areas. And um, as in I've bull, talked to them about bull, like a like a vol a vol vol a vol oh, okay okay vol yes yeah, okay. i was trying to what, because what was the connection between mouse and bull mice and a bull <laughs> and bull okay <laughs> mouse and bull yeah because they feed the carnivores right they're the main diet for most carnivores like cats and uh, coyotes wolves and so on yeah um so they affect the population of the carnivore which affects the population of prey animals and you know all, it goes all the way down the line. And now I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, <laughs> well so we're you were talking about everything being connected and you have these students staying with you who are studying the mouse and bull population. Right, in the, right. So it had something right. to do with everything being connected. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's not really what I wanted to say, but yeah, everything is, oh yeah, that's what it was. I was, I was talking to one of the students the other day and I, I, I told her that I tend to think in circular thinking I don't have mm -hmm. linear thinking and the reason for that is because 
the scripture talks about God working in me and through me and to me. So it's a circular mm -hmm. thing. You know, relationship is circular. It's reciprocal. It's giving and taking and taking and giving. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, life is, is circular. You know, uh, you know you're, you're born, you live, you die. You go into the ground. Your body provides nutrients for whatever, you know, everything is circular. And so every, it, it, and because it is, everything has to be connected. You know, mm -hmm. it has to be. And, and uh, I, um, this might seem a little off topic, but I had a dream one time that I was standing before the throne of God, okay? The judgment seat. Mm -hmm. And I was standing there and I wasn't afraid. I didn't feel afraid. And I could only see the Lord's feet. I couldn't see God, you know. And, um, and he was, you know, saying that, you know, okay, we're going to go over a few things. You know, we gotta, we're going to have a look at your life and we're going to go over a few things. And I was like, okay. And I wasn't scared. And then I heard this little cough behind me. And I turned around and there were myriads as far as the eye could see of people other regular people like me. And I was like, then all of a sudden I got scared. And I said to him, are they gonna hear all this? And he said, of course, because whatever happens to you happens to them. Hmm. And, and I was just like, okay, now, that, now that's scary, right? If it's just me and you, Lord, I'm good. <laughs> You know, I can handle it, but my life, you know, um, rippling out, affecting millions of other people's lives. And it, and, and that's what it is. It's that interconnectedness that we are, right? It's mm -hmm. the body of Christ and, and, and the world is that, mm -hmm. you know, like just, just look at Jordan Peterson. He's one man. Yep. And, and, and the amazing ripple effect of, of him speaking the truth, walking in integrity, sharing his ideas that he's mulled over like you and I for 15, 30 years, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, and just bringing those things into the light and, and people flocking to it like moths, you know, they're just like, oh, there it is you know and and what i have loved watching there is how whatever anomaly or difficulty or abuse is thrown at him it only increases his visibility it only increases the the number of people that he gets to speak to and i think part of that is well i mean i i know it's god I, I mean, from the beginning, it looked very much to me like that's God working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> allowing yeah. these, allowing these things to happen because that's going to amp, it's going to amp the signal. Mm -hmm. But um, the other thing that that said to me was he faces every one of those situations with such equanimity. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't get afraid and go hide under his bed. He just continues speaking the truth he continues living the truth and mm -hmm. and so that's why he's not afraid because he's living in the truth and jesus christ is the truth the way and the life so mm -hmm. yeah regardless of what he says about what he believes he is living yeah the truth right and so it's, right. I suppose it's a very complicated thing and we, we may never know what it all means, but when I look at it, that's what it means to me that because that's in he, here, because yeah, he continues to walk in gratitude and humility and he's speaking the truth and recognize, and somebody, you know, I've, exalting yeah, sorry, Christ. I, I, yeah. And I, you know, I've heard people kind of complain because there's no new information coming from Jordan Peterson. It's just the same old stuff. And I'm like, hello. You know, like if he was changing his message so that he could negotiate his way through all this political correctness and, 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 you know, kind of bend to the will of the people, 
and tell them what they want to hear, I'd be off, off that ship in like two seconds. I'd be jumping over. But no, it's the same story. It's the same message. It's the same truth. And, and, it, and it meets all the opposition. And the opposition is different, right? They're throwing, first they throw a few mud pies and then some snowballs and how about a, a rock, you know? Like they're trying all kinds of things and, and it's just coming up against that same thing, that same thing. And it's that rock, right? It's that stumbling stone that we were talking about where the, you know, stuff comes up against it and it breaks. It just, mm -hmm. and, and falls to the ground. And, and uh, I'm great. I'm fine with his message staying the same. It should stay the same. It has to stay the same because there is only one truth, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have to laugh a little bit when you say people are saying there's no new information from Jordan Peterson because yeah. I, it took me maybe three months of reading diligently every morning as much as I could possibly get through to get through the Maps of Meaning book. Right. And then I read it a second time. And now the third time I'm just rereading chapter four, the chapter on anomaly. And okay. there's enough information in that book that could keep you busy for 30 years if you were really paying attention. Right. Because every sentence is like a book. Every right. sentence has so much meaning in it that I could, I could take one sentence from his book and I could start writing and I would be writing about the connections of that sentence to everything that I know about science and mathematics and history and philosophy and economics and, wow. and my own life and, and the Bible. And I could just keep writing. So people right. that are saying there's no new information, they're not really looking at what's there. They're just taking no. some little surface message, like clean your room yeah. And, yeah. and believing that that's the whole show. <clears throat> yeah. You know? Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. So um, it's been such a delight to spend time with you. <laughs> yeah, I know. We have yeah. to do this again, Karen. I really enjoyed it. Well, let's do it. Really let's nice. do it again. And next time we'll get to the garden. <laughs> Although I think yeah. what we talked about today did touch on that. I do. Yeah. Yeah. The garden is huge for me. I'm, I love, I love, I, I think you can just, you can, there's so many things that you can take back to the garden and you can, you can kind of put it through the ringer, so to speak, you know, and see how it comes out on the other end because um, God's heart is in the garden, you know, that's his heart. And um I remember saying to Paul at one point, you know, I started with the first conversation in the garden and, and the second conversation, we, I started with a verse in Revelation. And I know everything else in the middle is important, but those really are the two things, right? That's God's heart. The garden and the new heaven and the new earth, mm -hmm. you know? And, and all the stuff in between is God revealing his character. And I don't know, uh, just before we we sign off here um i started reading it, I, I listened to that um conversation with the with paul and job and luke and jeff yes uh -huh. and um luke was talking about george mcdonald and the funny thing is um oh, i read I george McDonald. at the back I, re I read at the back of the north wind to my daughter when she was really little and i don't remember it actually and um and I thought, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta read some more George McDonald. So I, mm -hmm. I downloaded the unspoken sermons, and it's so mind blowing um, to me because Is that it's available for free online. Yes, Gutenberg.org. Because oh, yeah. I, I read, I read practically all of his fiction books that had been. There was a guy named. Well, I can't remember his name. Some guy back in the eight, 80s that translated all the fiction books over into an accessible version of English for us because okay. yeah, yeah. most of his fiction books are written in this real heavy, was he Welsh or He's Irish? Scottish. Scottish. Because most of it's written in this real heavy Scottish kind of lingo that, uh, that we don't mm -hmm. really understand. And so this guy had translated it all over into 
you know, modern American English. Yeah. And yeah. I read practically all of his novels back in the early 80s when I was a new believer. And oh my goodness, they're just amazing. So the unspoken, yeah, ser unspoken sermons on yeah. Gutenberg. Gutenberg Gutenberg.org. Actually, all of his works are available. So I think how they work is anything that doesn't have any copyright on it anymore. Uh -huh. uh, they offer for free and you can get it in various formats. So I just have the Kindle app on my iPad and I just download it right to my Kindle. And wow. Read. Okay. I'll put it, yeah. I'll put it in the information section on the video too. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it would be cool to talk about some of his ideas if you have a chance to read. Yeah. I, I would love those. that. I would love that. Let's yeah, do it. Really the garden yeah, and George cool. McDonald for next time. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Very good. Okay, have a great day. You too. And uh, thanks a lot for the conversation. Thanks, Sherry. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.